Hi, welcome to the The Array Show, where I have wide-ranging conversations with fascinating people. We talk about all things psychology, mental health, and wellness. Today, I'm joined by a behavioral scientist who's specializing in cyber psychology, Carolyn Freeman. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Dennis. Great to have you here, Caroline. Perhaps we could kick this off with you telling us your background, your trajectory in life, and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Okay, sure. Um, so I started my career as a marketer, actually, as a corporate marketer. Um, so I did brand um, communications and product development. Um, I did that for about 15 years. And then I kind of decided I'd had enough of big corporate life. So I retrained as a psychologist and went back to university, um, did an undergrad in psychology, and then I kind of stumbled across cyber psychology, actually. Um, and I've got a real fascination or always have had a real fascination with technology. And so kind of looking at cyber psychology and investigating a bit more, I realized that there was a real connection between my two passions in life, which is about behavior of people and technology. Um, and so I did a master's in cyber psychology back in university. Um, and it's kind of where I've ended up where I am now. So pretty much my career has been around behavior and how people um, originally at consumer behavior and how people bought things and why they bought things um, and understanding their, um, their rationale behind their behavior and then moving into more of a how people engage with technology and the behavior they have around technology. So there is a bit of a, a, a real correlation between the two careers really but that's that's really been my my trajectory um over the last 20 years now, now carolyn we actually shared a similar interest um as a content creator obviously i'm also fascinated with with technology but for the uninitiated um could you just you know um explain to us what's oh, uh, cyber psychology give us a quick overview um and how is it distinctive from other subsets of psychology Okay, um, so cyber psychology is really looking at how humans um, across various lifespans and different contexts engage with technology. So that's really digital technology, mostly um, the internet, how people engage with the internet, but then also social media, and then also the tools that we use to actually access the internet. Um, and this is, um, it's been pretty much, it's going, been going since technology became more mainstream back in the early 1990s but it's really started gaining traction in the last um, five, 10 years. And um, there's a number of universities now that do undergrads and postgrads in cyber psychology. Um, and there's now a cyber psychology section in the British Psychology Society. But really cyber psychology looks at so many different aspects of psychology from mental health all the way through to cognitive behavior therapy um, and technology in the workplace, as well as in education. Um, and, um, so it re it's a real applied science across all the various disciplines within psychology. Um, and where cyber psychology differs is really in, in terms of how people interact with technology and how that then changes their behavior um, and um, how uh, their, their behavior then changes how their technology use. Now, of course, Caroline, just like any other disciplines in psychology, just like any other subsets in psychology, it has its own um, sort of um, specialization. And I understand that you're primarily working within technology at work and play. So um, tell us more about that. Yeah. So um, the majority of cyber psychologists um, really look at sort of kind of from mental health to cyber security and social media use amongst young people. And so when I was doing my um, master's, what I noticed is that there isn't actually anyone who's focusing on technology use amongst adults around the workplace. And there are different other disciplines outside of psychology that look at um, human computer interactions around the workplace. They also is organizational psychology that looks at um, technology and, and how it operates. But I'm, um, I kind of noticed that there was this real big gap from a cyber psychology perspective of how technology is impacting us as workers. Um, the use of email, the use of um, the, the messaging systems and internal intranets, um, and also then looking at hybrid and remote working. And I started doing my um, dissertation right at the beginning of lockdown, the very first one back in March 2020. So I, I saw this as a really big opportunity to understand how we actually are taking technology or workplace technology into the home environment en masse and how that's then impacting us on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Um, so that's really why I specialise in this area um, of cyber psychology. Um, and it is really about around technology in the workplace and adults use or knowledge working adults using technology. Mm -hmm. And and you actually capitalise on that opportunity that you mentioned earlier. Um, you're actually at the forefront of, you know, raising awareness about what cyber psychology is and its application. And you set up a company called Cybercology. So tell us more about Cybercology, um, who's the target um, market, um, so to speak, and also what's your aim? Okay. Um, yeah, I did. So uh, with all with doing my dissertation and writing my literature review, one of the things that I noticed was there is so much rich information in the academic world across all these various disciplines. Um, and I want what I wanted to do was take this really rich knowledge and bring it into the mainstream and make it palatable and um, digestible for everyday knowledge workers, so that they could take that understanding of how technology impacts us in the workplace and um, implement it and apply it to their everyday life. So cybercology is, um, or my aim, my original aim for cybercology was creating it as a, as a magazine type of website that people can use it as a go-to of, I'm really struggling with this, or I'm really interested in this, um, so I really want to investigate a bit more. So it's um, looking at underpinning all the insights with academic research um, and academic insights and bringing it into more of a mainstream um, understanding of how we manage that technology. So that was the original purpose of it. Um, and it's kind of morphed slightly more into um, a, not just a magazine, but also a place where um, journalists and um, HR and learning development people can go and find out who the experts are within this field. And I'm starting to build up that database of cyber psychology experts that could help them with um, with workplace technology. So that's really what cyber psychology is. Um, it's yeah, and oh, in terms of the target market, the target market really is around those in the corporate world. So it is individuals who are knowledge workers who are kind of struggling a little bit with understanding how to manage their technology, but then also HR people, managers and learning development people within organizations who need a bit more insight into helping their teams to manage their technology use, both professional and personal technology use within the workplace. And that's with remote and hybrid working as well as actually in the face-to-face -face workplace itself. When you were talking about the, you know, the kind of like historical overview of cyber cyberology, I can't help but actually remind myself of how I started Psychrage, because just like you, um, I started Psychrage when I was doing my MSc, and um, you know, there the are lots of things to do during my MSc, but somehow I, I managed to find, um, you know, some some time to create Psychrage and also just that kind of like, you know, um, engage uh, the lay community when it comes to what psychology is about, but yours is more niche. You're, you're, you're more focused. You're trying to target um, a specific market. But um, what I'll do is um, I'll pop in the link um, to cyber ecology. So for anyone who, was, who wants to learn more about you and the work that you do, um, they could get in touch with you directly. But I'd like to touch upon one of the things that you said earlier. Um, Caroline, you said one of the key aims of cyber ecology is to deliver a more digestible content for um, your target market. And I suppose one of the um, more real life application of cyber psychology is work life balance, because um, that, that's something that I could really resonate with, um, because even before um, the lockdown, um, my work life and my personal life have kind of melded together, they've cohered together. And so I suppose people are really wondering how can we manage work like work life balance, especially for content creators like myself or people who are self-employed. So um can, can you give us some you know um tips on how we can do that? And more importantly, how can we segment work and home technology? Sure. Um this is kind of an um a really wishy-washy answer in some ways, but work-life balance is a real individual decision or real individual lifestyle choice. Um, for one person, work-life balance is um, is kind of segmenting their working day into blocks of time. For someone else, it's about doing five, six hours, eight hours in, a, in one single block and then completely switching off. So work-life balance is very individualistic and what might be a work-life balance for me might not, might be absolutely horrendous for someone else. So for me, my work-life balance means I start work at eight and I finish by six and I break my day into blocks of time with sections of 
um, downtime in between that. And I schedule my work so that I can kind of do some deep focus stuff. And then at six o'clock, I turn off all workplace technology. And for me, that is my work-life balance. Um, and it fits within my lifestyle. It fits within the things that I'm doing um, and how I choose to do to, to do my life um, with my lifestyle expectations and dreams. Um, so it's a very individualistic choice. But one of the key things we need to do if we want to manage our work-life balance is to really map out what that means for us as individuals. So what is important to me? Um, do I have a hobby that I really want to do? Do I want to study? Do I want to improve my knowledge in a specific area? And um, do I want to spend more time with my children or my spouse or on my own? Um, what is that, if I'm going to take up a hobby, what does that hobby look like? Um, how much time do I want, want to dedicate to it? So it's mapping out those really important lifestyle things, choices that we want to make that are really important to us. And then looking at, well, how does that then fit into my the workplace expectations of what I need to do to achieve my job? Um, and if, if it is about actually I need a solid blocks of time to do my, uh, my lifestyle choices, then how I'm going to manage that. But actually then separate out that workplace technology use from personal technology use. And I always say to people, um, don't... Um, Allow, don't give out your personal work number and don't give your personal number out to work people have a separate work number even if it means having a separate phone it means then that at when you don't want to be working you turn that phone off or you leave it in a specific space separate out your technology use so um i have my laptop that is only work um, and when work is done i close my laptop and it signifies mentally it signifies that actually i'm done with work <clears throat> I also don't include my email address on my or upload my email emails onto my phone. So um, or social media, actually. So my phone is completely personal time. Um, and it's and I also then have an iPad, which is entertainment time. So my personal stuff, I use my phone as a phone, not as a portal to the Internet or portal to social media, or portal into work. It is my personal um, space. Um, and even with that, I then. On weekends, on a on a Sunday, I leave my phone in a completely different room. I check it two or three times just to make sure I haven't missed any important calls. But I I separate myself out from the technology, and it's it's really given me or my brain and my conscious the ability to say actually this is me time now. This is when I live in this space. I'm fully present in this space. I'm not drawn back to technology. I'm not drawn back into work mentally and subconsciously. Um, and I'm kind of parking other things in my life that right now they need to be parked But because I, I need me time and I need time to energize. So I'm um, going back to what I was originally saying at the beginning of the section is that it, it really is about a personal choice and things that we decide we want to achieve in life and making conscious and cognitive and definitive choices. Um, and someone said to me a while ago, which I've really taken on board, is it's not about doing digital detoxes. It's like you wouldn't do um, the digital, uh, sorry, like a nutritional detox only helps you for a certain period of time, but actually making lifestyle changes and bringing in a nutritional philosophy helps you to actually achieve um, body changes. Um, and the same way digital philosophies help you achieve technological changes. So instead of doing a digital detox, have a think about what philosophy you want to take on board when it comes to engaging with workplace and personal technology. What do you want to achieve? What is important to you? Um, is it about being fully present in, in the here and now? Or is it about being constantly connected? And that really is a personal choice um, and something you have to um, find solutions or find ways to actually implement on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, absolutely. And what, what you've actually mentioned earlier about, you know, having separate um, gadgets, having separate spaces, um, that's really something that um, I, I also do myself because I, I don't want just to keep on, even Twitter sometimes, it feels like, um, do, do I use this time to just kind of like look for the content that I enjoy or do I actually use this time to promote the content that I create? So yeah. it's really important that you kind of segregate um, devices, gadgets, or if you want, you could also create um, a different um, social media channels. But um, just to carry on the conversation about that, um, obviously um, technology also kind of have positive, positive impacts, um, say for instance, productivity. So um, 
currently, how does technology impact our levels of productivity and effectiveness within the workplace? Um, it's, it's kind of a two-sided thing to productivity and technology because um, there was when Blackberries first were first introduced into the marketplace, it meant that professionals and knowledge workers were able to take their emails with them wherever they went. Instead of having this massive um, laptop that they had to drag around, they could sit on the train or when, when they got downtime, just check through the emails and kind of just... Um, get rid of a lot of things on the to-do list rather than for waiting to come into their email at their at the desk on their desktop at work but what's um the shift then to smartphones has done is it's made us constantly connected to our emails and our social media accounts and all other messages so um, yes, it can make us a lot more productive, but actually when we're constantly connected to technology, what that does is it means that our brains are constantly on, constantly working, constantly processing information, and we never give it the ability to have some downtime and re-energize because work and thinking takes a lot of cognitive um, strain. And we become cognitively exhausted day after day of engaging with this constant stream of um, communication and what that then does is that means that when we get to going to sleep um, we are still our brain is still ticking we're still hyper vigilant with the amount of work that we have to do and the amount of things that we have on our to-do list so we don't sleep long enough we don't sleep deep enough that means the next day we actually aren't um, refreshed enough to be as productive as we could be or should be, which means that there's more pressure on us. If we don't get the work we need to, there's more pressure on us to actually um, work longer into the evening and engage with te te technology and catch up on the work. And there's this constant downward spiral of um, not having enough energy to be productive and do deep work, but also then um, that means that we're not sleeping enough, we're not switching off enough, we don't give our brains and our bodies time to re-energize. And the other thing with technology in terms of productivity is that with our um, constant switching on, um, we have, oh, how many of us have like five or six or 20 tabs open at the same time? So we're constantly switching between these tabs. We're constantly switching and scrolling through our social media feeds and then switching between them and scrolling through another one. So our brain is, is being trained to not pay attention to very much and the um, or for very long. And the research shows that um, we are really struggling to read long text these days because we've trained our brain to skim through um, through digital technology media. Um, and that means that when we get to the point of needing to focus on big, important projects, we haven't trained our brain enough or kept it fit enough to do deep work and to really focus and concentrate. So we've lost the ability or losing the ability to pay um deep attention um, for long periods of time. And we constantly distracting ourselves with, oh, I just need to check that email. Oh, let me just check what's going on on LinkedIn. Um, instead of actually going, I really need to focus on this really hard cognitive task, we choose rather to take the easy option of checking our social media feed. And it's that constant switching that is keeping us from actually doing that deep work that makes us as productive as we should be. So productivity levels generally have declined, although we physically working a um, number of hours, we're not being as productive as we ought to be. So there's a, um, a positive and a negative, a, 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 an upside and a downside to, to technology use. And we're the ones who have to manage this um, and manage our own engagement with that technology. And um, in doing so, we can improve the way that we can increase our productivity mm -hmm. in the same way as doing exercises at, on a regular basis helps improve our fitness. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a range of technology that can help us manage to, you know, as what you've said, um, deep concentration, focus more on what we're doing. There are some apps that would, you know, like block your notifications. Um, and that, that's really helpful. Now, um, early on the intro, you mentioned, Caroline, that um, cyber psychology is really um constantly evolving dynamic discipline. And um, what, one of these new newest things that I've heard is um, metaverse. I don't fully understand what it is anyway, but perhaps you could kind of orient us. And um, I, I think related to 
um, metaverse is this idea of augmented reality. So um, based from your experience, how is it changing work and play? Um, the metaverse, I don't know if even those who are building the metaverse have, have a real clear context of what that's going to look like. Um, it's very hard to describe something that doesn't yet exist. Um, and But what um, it seems to be, as it's kind of the connectivity of um, of all humans in a space that is um, a different reality. So um, it's it's like Ready Player One. If you've ever seen that movie, it's kind of that is a real good um, indication of what the metaverse would probably aim to look like. Um, virtual and augmented reality are slightly different from each other, and that virtual reality is being completely immersed in a virtual world with the goggles on that block out all um, real world visual and audible um, engagement. Augmented reality is imposing or superimposing a virtual world onto the real world scenario. So you can still see what's going on around you, but there's other elements that are um, interacting within that or visually interacting within that real world. Um, I think it's probably about five or ten years time that we will start really seeing how the metaverse is used within a workplace environment. And even then, I don't think the vast majority of companies will really engage with the metaverse to the degree that they will in 15 or 20 years time. It might be less than that. But I don't see um, a number of companies really picking up on that and seeing the advantages of advantages of that metaverse environment and, and it will differ across different industries. Um, in terms of virtual and augmented reality, I would suggest that augmented reality probably has more of a future in the organizational world than virtual reality. There are some really good uses of virtual reality for businesses, but in terms of team engagement and teamwork, I think if they if um, Microsoft really have um, the in the Oculus, I'm sorry, not in the Oculus and the um, just HoloLens and um, the HoloLens technology, they've, um, they have the marketplace really on augmented reality and it's, it's an incredibly expensive headset to buy. Um, and, and it needs more work and cheaper technology to actually go into the mainstream. Um, but I think it's probably five, 10 years time that companies will kind of go, actually, there's something that we can use here that'll help bring teams together and do a lot more collaborative working. The other side of that is that there needs to be the justification for it from the perspective of our teams spread throughout the world um, and key people who need to meet together on a physical basis on um, regularly. If that's the case, then going to technology like metaverse and virtual reality and augmented reality makes sense. But if the team is all physically located in one geographical space, that kind of technology doesn't really make sense from a day to day workplace um, engagement. So. Um, I think there's a lot of advantages, but I don't think it's going to be mainstream for quite some time. It, it actually reminds me of um, the first thing, the first time that um, Twitter was rolled out. I was at I was at university, and um, when I used Twitter the first time, like back in the day, um, when I first Twitter, uh, when I used Twitter the first time, I was like, "This is quite pointless." Um, what was it for? But ultimately, it's the users who's going to shape um, it, its utility, and I suppose. That's yeah. how um, this um, metaverse, this um, augmented reality is going to to pan out. Um, it's, yeah. it's the users who's going to, you know, what is it for? What what how how can we make this technology more valuable? Exactly, and and that's the case. Sorry, with a lot of technology, is that technology is developed, and then the users make uh, find ways to make it work for them. So. And it's often different from what the original developers had in mind. And um, those who use it kind of go, actually, I can use it here, I can use it there. And more apps are developed and it's tweaked and changed to become something quite different from what the original thought process was behind how we use this and engage with this technology. So exactly what you're saying with Twitter, you kind of go, what's the point? And then it develops over time and people make it into something that is useful for them. Yeah, I, I bet that developers of Twitter were not, you know, envisioning it to be as divisive as it is now, but there you go. Exactly. Um, now, um, Carolyn, um, of course, um, we, you, you were involved with um, cyber, um, cyber ecology and um, I was going through it in preparation for this interview. And I understand that you mentioned in one of your articles that there is a difference between job control and autonomy. And what's exactly the difference? 
Okay. Um, it's a small difference. It's quite subtle, but it's actually quite an important difference. Um, now, autonomy is when um, it's often um, those who are in more professional fields or who hire up in management or have been with the company for a very long time. It's those individuals who have the ability to shape how they get their work done. So that's both in terms of when they work, how they work, and what they work on in order to achieve their goals and their key performance indicators and the things they need to do. And that really is autonomy. Um, lawyers have a lot of autonomy in terms of getting, especially if they're quite high up in the business, um, in terms of getting uh, winning cases and getting things done. Now, job control is different from autonomy in that those who have job control aren't able to um, define how they get the work done or what they get done in order to achieve the goals. Um, job control is really about when you work. So during the pandemic, um, especially in first lockdown, uh, and with a lot of school children being um, working from um, doing school schooling at home, a lot of parents were given the flexibility and ability to decide how many hours um, they worked in the morning and the afternoons and the evenings and when they got the work done. So instead of um, saying you have to do the work between nine to five, as you would if you came into the office, you work around your family demands and needs as long as you get the work done. So that's really job control is to be able to decide when you get the work done. Autonomy is two or three steps above that is how you do the work and what you do in order to get the work done. Um, and if you can have someone who does remote working, um, especially if they've got a family responsibilities and children and other caregiving responsibilities, giving them an element of job control. Um, what I found in my, my research or came out during that research is giving them an element of job control really reduces stress and anxiety because then they can juggle their work around their life um, and they don't, they're not forced to actually um, split their time between feeding their child, answering emails, doing a project, getting the presentation in time. Um, so they're able to really manage both all their different types of responsibilities and both their home and work life. Um, but autonomy is a whole different level of um, real freedom to get your work done whenever, however, and whatever you need to do to get it done. Let, let, let's talk about your research, Caroline. So what are some of the research that you're working on? Okay, so the research that I'm working on at the moment um, is really desktop research. I'm not doing any active research projects, but what I am doing is having a look at and, and, and going back into um, other research that has been done before on work at, or technology and cognition and how technology changes how our brain operates, how it changes our attention and how it changes our ability to be productive. So um, and it's really based on cognitive changes. So the neuro neuroplasticity of our brain in relation to technology. And then looking at that in terms of how that's then applied within the workplace. So a lot of the research has been done on students and young people. How can we then translate that into working environments? And then looking at that from a hybrid working environment perspective. So it's taking theory behind technology use and brain plasticity and then um, making that very practical. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really the research that I'm doing at the moment is a lot of um, desktop research and literature reviews. And of course, um, needless to say, this research that you're doing um, serves as the bedrock of the resources available on cyber cyber cybercology cyber website. Yeah. I get it right one of these days, <laughs> cybercology website. Um, but um, to tell us more about the, the resources, because obviously those um, are, um, the article that you mentioned earlier is, is this one of those resources. But um, yes, tell us more. OK, so um, there are a few resources at the moment. Um, I am obviously building it. It's a work in progress live site. So there's constantly new things being added, new sections being added. Um, one of the big things I'm building at the moment is a cyber psychology expert section. So I'm similar to what you're doing with um, psychologists generally. I am interviewing cyber psychologists, but getting them to send me all their, the work that they've done that are related to workplace technology use and highlighting that on my website. So the objective of that is that um, as I was saying before, if there's someone in HR or someone in media or someone in management who can, kind of goes, actually, there's someone I need to talk to about cyberbullying. I'm not an expert in cyberbullying in the workplace or in cyberbullying in general. 
I would like them to be able to go there and say, this is a person I need to talk to about workplace bullying because they understand the implications and the psychological um, processes that go on both from a bullying as well as a, from a victim perspective. I can wing it. I can kind of give you a generic overview of my understanding of cyberbullying, but I'm not the experts and I don't want to position myself as such. So that's what I'm currently building up. Um, I'm also currently starting to build workshops. Um, so there will be some, um, well, just this morning I actually put up the, the first page on workshops and just building that up um, over time. Um, I've also got some research summaries, which I'm also building up from the research I'm doing, providing a, a summary of the research and then providing that um, as well as a link to the original research that people can kind of read the summary and then go look at the original research as if they want to go more in depth um, and looking at that across a number of categories, uh, workplace categories. Um, and then I'm also provide some book recommendations on things that if someone's really interested in specific areas of cyber psychology or related subjects around cyber psychology, they can go then read those in more detail. Um, so yeah, and, and I only put books up there that I've actually physically read. Um, I don't put up books there just because it sounds like it could be a good thing to read. Um, but as I said, it's a live work in progress site. Um, there's so many resources that I'm planning, hoping to build into it over the next um, couple of weeks, months, years. Thank you. And of course, um, Carolyn, um, you've been doing a lot of work um, within cyber psychology. You've carried out a number of research and I would imagine you've come across a number of misconceptions. So this is your chance to identify those misconceptions and address them. Um, I think probably my biggest bugbear around misperceptions is that when I first say to someone I'm a cyber psychologist, they start talking about cyber security and the practical applications of cyber security. And I have to kind of go, hold on a second, I don't do cyber security, I do cyber psychology, um, which is about the use of the technology um, and the impact on us as individuals. Um, so that's one of the misconceptions around what cyber psychology is. Um, another one is that they kind of automatically, if they don't go down the cyber security route, they automatically then go down, a, well, you need to speak to schools about technology use amongst young people. Um, and you need to um, talk to teachers about this and educate teachers. And um, for me, that is a massive misconception about where technology use behavior comes from in terms of, yes, there does need to be school policies and procedures. Yes, there does need to be ways of engaging with technology within the school environments. But actually technology use and the behavior that children have around technology use comes from the home and social environments. So children use technology based on how they see adults using technology. And if you in the home as an adult are constantly scrolling through a phone and looking at social media posts or replying to emails, but you say to your child, you can't have screen time or your screen time is limited. There's a mismatch for the child in terms of their understanding of how technology is used and how we behave around technology. Um, so, yeah, those are, that's also kind of one of my big bugbears and kind of um, people blame certain elements of society of the, the downsides of technology use. And actually we need to all take responsibility for how we engage with technology. Um, the other misconception around technology and especially cyber psychology is around um, how gaming is, um, is so bad for you. And yes, there are elements of gaming, like anything in life, there's an elements that can become addictive and can be bad and can change how people in, um, operate in the real world. But there's a lot of positive things around gaming and also around social media use. Um, the media in general, the general world media um, or mass media often um, lambasts gaming and social media use as something that's really bad and horrible. And yes, there is but they don't provide the other side of the arguments around how actually during the pandemic, social media helped us build and create and maintain a community um, of those around us who can support us both mentally and emotionally, maybe not physically, but in other ways. So it helped us, especially those who are on their own to create this community and, and engage and still be human while still being on our own. Um, and so there's a lot of misconceptions. There's just a couple of them that I've, um, that are, yeah, as I say, my, my bugbears and kind of those really want to clear this up. 
with whoever talks to me because those are the main areas of conversation that people go into when when they first find out I do cyber psychology. Mm -hmm. well, what about porn consumption or over the internet? Um, would you say some of the things that we hear is kind of misconception that you know, like the more you are exposed to porn, it would have negative impacts on you. And I'm not a specialist in internet porn use at all. I actually have a friend of mine who is a um, therapist in, in internet porn um, and um, sexual uh, porn or sexual um, kind of uh, in addiction. That's the word. Um, and what I'm telling you now is just my generic conversations or the summary of my generic, generic conversations with her. Um, and what she's been saying is that what porn um, online has done for young people is that so many of them are watching porn now as a generic whereas previously you had to go into a store and buy a porn magazine and hide it under something else because there's people around you who might know you and you there's very few people that actually um, go out and buy a porn magazine but now it's readily available and a lot of parents don't know how to put restrictions on children's technology so children have the ability to go watch porn on a regular basis and what that's doing in their relationships is that young ladies think that they need to behave in this particular way in order to um, have a sexual relationship and men need to behave in a particular way to gratify a woman in a sexual relationship so their perception of a loving engaging sexual relationship has completely shifted to something that is um, very different from what it was or what it has historically been. So the expectations around relationships and sexual activity has, has shifted for younger people. For older people and those who um, kind of grew up slightly more analog pre the introduction, um, the, the overall easy accessible porn on the web, is that they often need to engage in a lot more uh, pornographic um, activity or watching a lot more pornographic activity in order to um, create um, the simulation of satisfaction within um, a sexual relationship because watching porn um, increases your or, or it's kind of an unnatural engagement with sexual activity so if your partner is not behaving in that way you aren't as satisfied and actually you have high expectations and it's like taking drugs or any form of drugs you have to actually have more um, different, wilder, crazier kind of sexual activity to get the same element of gratification. So it is shifting amongst the older population the expectation of what um, that gratification is within the sexual environment. Absolutely. And this is a very topical issue. At the, at the time we're talking about this, the online safety bill is actually being introduced, being, being um, talked about on um, by, by um, MPs and, and the government. Now, um, Carolyn, you gave us a good whistle tour of cyber ecology earlier, but um, what's the long-term goal? Um, the long-term goal of cyber ecology is still really the reason why I set it up in the first place. It's about, well, my ideal is to have it as a go-to place for those in the workplace, whether they're individuals looking for help in managing their work-life balance and managing their technology use, or managers within a workplace who kind of looking at how they can better manage hybrid um, and remote teams. And also for HR and learning development people within an organization to go there and have a look at how they can um, skill up their workplace or workforce, both in terms of the generic work workers as well as then the managerial levels, and how they can create a really healthy um, technological environment within within the workplace and help the employees manage that workplace and home-based technology and that's kind of why I've had I, I do the psychology of technology work and play it's because we need technology and work and we need technology for play because that's how we operate now but how do we manage those in a healthy way um, that that empowers us to live a fulfilling life and a more productive life and use it so that it can be um, it can work for us rather than us being slaves to it. So that's kind of my aim overall. Or that's where I'm going is really to create this go to hub for people to be able to go there, um, find resources that they need to better manage their technology use for work and play and for adults, not children. This is really about adults, grown ups. 
<laughs> now, Carolyn, um, we're already crawling towards the end of this interview, but I'd just like to hear more about the personal side of Carolyn. So I've actually saved up um, a few questions to learn more about you um, as, as a human, as a person. So um, what would you say are the highlights of your career so far? Um, I'd say probably the biggest highlight is um, the taking the courage and the kind of jumping out of a career which I was really good at and really enjoyed and was pretty well paid for to jump out of that and start again um, and for me that was a real highlight because it meant that I could do the thing that I found that I actually really loved um, and I can spend the rest of my career doing this thing that I'm really passionate about um, so it's a lot more fulfilling for me doing this than what I was doing before even though I loved it this is so much more fulfilling um, so that really is a big highlight for me is the courage um, of jumping into something new um, and then also doing my cyber psychology masters is a massive highlight it's always been my dream to do something in kind of higher education and um, post-grad and this has really given me the opportunity to do that. So, um, yeah, I'd say those are the two biggest highlights. Mm. Now, of course, um, starting an organisation such as Cyber Psychology, it has a lot of implications, <laughs> even financial implications. It's not easy to, to set up something up scratch. So what would you say are the biggest learning since you started? Um, probably my biggest learning is um, bravery. And I know that so many people say that, but it's kind of being brave with myself. Um, and having an element of self-efficacy and building that up in terms of um, getting over myself was really tough and learning to do that was quite tough as well. Um, coming from a corporate environment where there's so many specialists um, that are just as good as you um, and also being in a world of cyber psychology where there's so many academics who's so much better than you, kind of being brave um, and learning to trust my own self in putting things out there um, and exposing myself to the world in terms of this is my brain, these are my emotions, these are my thoughts that are going out for approval or um, criticism. Um, and having the courage to do that was, I think, a real learning curve for me. Still is. I'm still getting over getting over myself. And it is a process. But um, yeah, for me, that's been a real, a real learning, um, personal and professional learning. And is there a particular individual or a book which has the greatest influence in your work or how you approach to do things? Um, I think probably the, the individual that I'd have to cite here is the one that's had the most impact on me in cyber psychology is um, my supervisor during my research masters, um, Masa, Pop Masha Pop Popovac. I can never pronounce her name, sorry, Masha. Um, but she um, she was incredibly encouraging, incredibly helpful in, in um, opening up the world of cyber psychology to me in a way I never expected to. And she built a real love of the subject into me um, throughout the um, time that I was doing my master's. So she's had a massive impact on me. Um, from a book perspective, um, I can't actually name one. There's so many different books that I've really um, engaged with and, and that I take little bits from and I go, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, and being able to take sections of that and merge into something that's uniquely me, um, it's really hard to say this is the one, but yeah. And um, if there's another time, there's another space, what would have Carolyn Freeman been if you were not a behavioral scientist? Um, another time, another space, uh, probably if I'd carried on with marketing, that's what I would have done and moved into more of a consumer behavior, consultancy side of things, looking at how people shop, um, both online and offline and how that's changing. Um, but probably if I had to do something completely different is um, go into gardening <laughs> and do garden design and landscape gardening. Um, I know that's really left field, but um, I've kind of inherited a, a love of green things from my grandmother who had real green fingers and everyone from my childhood remembers her as having the most vibrant, incredible garden. And um, since I've bought a house with my husband and we've got a garden um I've been digging a lot um and growing a lot of stuff and it's just and changing and and building things within the garden so um it's kind of I've discovered a hobby and something that I'm really good at um halfway through my life really and um I think if I'd known this back when I was in my teens I might well have gone off in a completely different career direction but now it's more of an engaging hobby um, 
that keeps me um, away from technology and something that I can do that, that really um, uses up cognitive skills um, but re and, and re-energizes me. So I think I'd probably do that if I wasn't doing this. Yeah, um, we, we won't be chatting by now if you, if you ventured into <laughs> that. You would have been on an allotment or, or garden centre. Probably. <laughs> but um, Carolyn, um, finally, the floor is all yours. Um, tell us what is in the pipeline. You mentioned a bit about workshop for um, um, cyber ecology. So um, tell us more about that. And if people wanted to reach out to you, what platforms can they get in touch with you at? Okay. Um, to answer your last question first, um, for cyber ecology, I have um, a LinkedIn profile as well as Twitter. Um, and then obviously through my website, cyberecology.com. Um, but in terms of the way forward, the big focus at the moment is um, kind of trying to build some workshops. And this is individual workshops as well as workshops for, um, for companies to go in and, and talk to companies. I'm doing quite a few talks and conferences over the next couple of months. So that's um, quite a big focus for me. But more than that, it's really about putting a lot of stuff into this brain of mine. I'm doing a lot of reading, a lot of um, diving into literature um, and reading new books that are coming out from various experts. Um, and it's trying to build up a real good conversation around um, workplace technology use. Um, so I am kind of trying to do quite a bit of social media stuff as well um, and, and write a lot of blogs and download what I'm learning into the great wide world of the internet so that I can train and educate others. Mm -hmm. And by any chance would this be online based or you're planning to have um, more personal personalised? Yeah, mostly online because um, mm -hmm. I want to be able to reach people across the world or mm -hmm. kind of the English speaking world and um, it, it's really hard to do that face to face mm -hmm. but I will, I will be doing face to face stuff as well but it's really about getting as big a reach as I can. Uh, absolutely. And of course, uh, more details about the workshops and the resources are available on um, the Cyber Ecology website, um, which is available on the description note. Well, um, Caroline Freeman, it's a pleasure having you here on the Dear Age show. Um, thank you for sharing your insights and also about cyber ecology. But unfortunately, our time is up. But yeah. I look forward to hearing more about your work. Well, thank you for, for having me on. It's been a real joy.